This is Beyond the Bench with Nick Morgison and Nick Federa. A look at sports and pop culture from beyond common sense. The show that constantly goes off the rails and might never get back on. When you don't belong, you're a bench warmer. On this show, there's no riding the bench. This is Beyond the Bench on the Empty the Bench Podcast Network. Hello, everybody. Hi. Welcome back. Oh, I'm pushing wrong buttons already. Welcome to, welcome to episode 14 of Beyond the Bench on the Empty the Bench podcast network. That's Nick Federa. I'm Nick Morgison. Follow the show on social media at Beyond the Bench One on Twitter. And if you want to follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Beyond the Bench One. And also follow the show on the Empty the Bench podcast network at ETB Network. Follow him at Nick Wright's Words. Follow me at Ed Morgison Radio. Boy, do we have a jam-packed uh, episode to get to. Yes, we do. So let's not waste any more time and dive right in. So, Nick, I feel like this story is just going to unfortunately follow us for the next, like, bajillion years. And I think you know where I'm going with this. Uh, Yeah, unfortunately. So we're going to start with this one. So... Stephen A. Smith, his so public this, battle with COVID. This would normally be an empty the bench kind of thing that we that we would focus on, but seeing as how we're we're cooking up a lot of stuff for that, we would end up we, this kind of well, one kind of ended up shunted over to over to here. But uh, yes, yeah, so, so for those of you who don't know, Stephen A. Stephen A. Smith tested positive for COVID. I think it was what like two month, uh, almost two months ago. Yeah, it was a couple of months ago, and apparently he had it quite badly. Yes, he did. He actually said he interrupted part of first take this week, saying that he almost he had a uh, he had bad chills. He had a, a cough that that uh, caused him uh, pain in his ribs. I think he said it almost broke his ribs. Yeah, he had a hundred and three degree fever every night. This is a quote: "I had a hundred and three degree fever every night. Woke up with chills in a pool of sweat." Now that that sounds like an oxymoron, partially. It is technically, but it, it's really just a turn of phrase. And then he goes on to say, "Quote: Headaches were massive, coughing profusely. They told me had I not." been vaccinated i wouldn't be here that's how bad i was i had pneumonia in both lungs my liver was bad and it ravaged me which i'm inclined to believe him because like i said omicron it like i've always said like i've been saying again and again and again and again and again since this thing started you don't want it covid is really 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 bad no well, i you know what it affects people differently Right, but and you know I what? he got the short end of the stick. And I understand. And the quote which I have here, which is the next line, Smith went on to say that COVID almost took me out. Now, I said this to Nick. See, before. you think he's playing it up? No, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. So, a lot of people who are big names in in the entertainment business or big time in celebrity, a lot of times they'll play stories up because they want to make themselves look more dramatic than they normally are. Now, dramatic not- or traumatic. Traumatic, yes, traumatic. Well, what, what, what did you mean? Do you mean dramatic or do you mean traumatic? Because it's two different things. Well, dramatic, really, because I think he he constantly makes things more dramatic than they have to be. Yeah, it, you were saying. So, I I'm not disagreeing. I, I if he's saying that he had a hundred three degree fever and he woke up with chills, uh, excuse me, chill. I can't speak in a pool of sweat, then. I believe him, but don't say it almost took me out. Come on. I mean, it very well could have. We don't know if he has any kind of pre-existing conditions. You don't know what people are working with here. And did he? Did it say he was boosted too, or was he? Uh... I think he just vaccinated. I, I, I mean, I thought I read somewhere that. In, well, and I'm assuming it's probably an ESPN thing that they probably have to be vaccinated times two. I'm assuming. Yeah, and, I mean, I would imagine, but but you know, it's Stephen A. Smith. He works under a different set of rules than the than the uh, the plebes at ESPN proper do. Yeah, but I'm going to tell you right now, ESPN has fired people. We did stories on this. Do you remember? Yeah. Yes, did. they have. 
But I really don't. I I really think they'd stop short of firing him if he refused to get the vac. If he refused to get the vaccine, I think they would suspend him before firing him. I think, which is not really the operative point here, because he did get vaccinated. So what 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 it means here is the point of this, because you've already seen people. It almost killed it, the, the vaccine. Uh, uh, doesn't help because he still got it and it almost killed him. The operative word here I want to focus on is almost. Did it kill him? No. Which means that the vaccine is pretty much doing what it should be. But however, th there's a problem I have here, and I'll let you finish that point. But the issue I have here, he knows he's a public figure. He knows that if he uses the proper words to describe this, it's going to go viral and it's going to go everywhere. Yeah, I mean, I don't think he was fishing for sympathy. Well, then why was he talking? He, he talked about it constantly on first take. If you're not fishing for attention, then don't talk about it. Because he's trying, but because he's trying to get people to get vaccinated and to take this uh, to take this seriously. I think he understands that more than most. I, I mean, get it. I, it, it it sounds weird coming out of my mouth, but I think he means it this time. I get it, but he's been traveling crisscrossing the country. Yeah. Yeah, so, that, 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 that's also the other thing. I mean, we don't know. I, I, I tend not to treat it as a personal, or I used to, but I, I, I tend not to treat getting COVID as, as a personal moral failing anymore. I mean, which is which is really a dick thing for me to do. But, but uh, here's, again. the other line that got me annoyed, too, is he said he also reflected that he's, quote, lucky and sincerely blessed to be back at ESPN, quote, because two and a half, three weeks ago, I didn't know if I was going to make it. Like, all right, I get it. I understand. But do you have to, like, bring it up to a level a million? Like, it's Stephen A. I, I, that, that, that's the frequency that he operates in. You know that. So he knew. So then he knew what he was doing then. Like, he knew that. Wait, wait what are you implying? That he got COVID on purpose? No. I, he knew what he was doing by playing it up in, in the media. Because he knew everyone was going to cover it. I think part, yeah, I think part of that was his plan. Because again, getting the message out when it comes from Stephen A. Smith, like I mean, as much as you, as much as we don't care for him as much, he is still a meaningful voice in sports media. He's one of the most meaningful voices. Uh, you roll your eyes, but but I mean, am I wrong? No, you're not really. wrong. Look I just inside your, look inside yourself. Look me right in the eye. I said, look me in the eye and tell me I'm wrong. I didn't say you were wrong. I, I, I Trust because me. Because I'm not wrong. I, I know he's an influential voice. I and, and that those words pain me every time I have to say influential voice with Stephen A. Because there are times when he purposely will do things that make you want to punch him in the face. Yes. It usually has to usually has to do with his takes on sports but if it but if it's something or usually if he just comes out of a bad uh, with a bad take he usually just ends up looking like a buffoon well <laughs> i'll give you one better i was i don't know who i was watching he was doing a podcast interview with somebody <coughs> excuse me and he basically said sometimes i have to take the opposite side to make good television which is why i which is again my point here is he knew what he was doing. Well, it, that that's also your point because he knew what he was doing and he knew that his words ca uh, carried that sort of weight. Now, let me be very clear, just so we don't, neither of us get misconstrued when people listen to this. I wouldn't wish COVID on my worst enemy in this situation whatsoever. Yes. I, I, yes. Well, no. Uh, yeah. No, you don't want to. Yes, you wouldn't. Right. And I'm not saying, first of all, it's the odds of you going out and trying to get COVID. First of all, how do you do that? To why would you do that? Why would you do that? But but three, he definitely played this up way more than he had to. Because this is, you know, you know what this is? This is a case of Stephen A recognizing his muscle and using it to serve a purpose. Now, whether that actually works remains to be seen. You know the sick theory that just went through my head right now? That 
ESPN behind the scenes is was probably going like this, like, oh, we have a news story. We have a news story. They're already they're already paying in the GDP of several small nations. So I I, I would imagine they're pretty happy with what they got. No, no, but I'm saying ESPN behind the scenes was like was like rubbing their hands together, like, oh my god, we're gonna make money today. Well, look and at all the sponsors that, we're gonna get. That what drives them? Isn't that what drives them more than anything else? What money? Oh yeah, obviously. Yeah, obviously. But, yeah, but when does health? Uh, it's a dumb question because we deal with the NFL on empty the bench uh, every Saturday. But no, no, finish it. No, no, I was just at the point. I was about to say that. Why would it really? When does health become an issue over money? And then I realized that we we money deal with tends to win over health. That's the that's the exact problem that we're dealing with. That's what I, that's why I jokingly said we deal with it, the NFL on empty the yeah. bench every Saturday, and they don't give a shit whether you've seen pretty much the 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 a sterling example of what not to do in a public health crisis from the NFL and the MLB and to a certain extent the NBA. And and by the way, just he's on the list of many in the world of TV, big name hosts that got COVID this time around from Omicron. Because it just it just goes to show you just how contagious Omicron is. By the way, most of late night was remote the last most couple of weeks. Night, yes, yeah, it was. Uh, Kimmel got it. Uh, got it uh, uh, Fallon got it. And uh, Myers. Myers got it. Yeah. And Corden. Corden got it. Savannah the Guthrie. One I think didn't get it was, was uh, Colbert. Right, and uh, Savannah Guthrie from, um, from the good, Today Show. Got, the so, Today Show got yeah, it. Yeah. So we. So again, we really. For those of for the for those of us for those of you whose word whose words carry any weight, those of you who listen to us, please take the proper precautions. Yeah, please and get you, vaccinated if you're not. Please get boosted if you're not. Please wear a mask if you got one. Please. I mean, please. This whole thing is stupid. And actually, there's another name on here. I didn't realize it. Not TV, but Billie Eilish. She did, too. She had it in December. Which, actually, I think I did know that. But, again, every everybody's getting it, which means the taking the proper precautions needs to take precedent over everything else. And, by the way. She's quoted as saying, I want it to be clear that it is because of the vaccine that I'm fine. I think if I weren't vaccinated, I would have died because it was bad. Which, again. I'm just tired. Again, I mean, in Stephen A's case, we don't know which variant he might have had. So so it could have been Delta. It could have been, it could have been, uh, could have been Omicron. Well, I thought they said that Omicron spread more, but it wasn't as... It, it spread more, but it's not as virulent. But but again, the, there's there's research, there's more research that needs to be done about that. There's no there's no scientific consensus of how deadly it actually is. You know what's next? I feel like there's going to be a new category created called vaccine politics. Like that's going to be the next thing that we're going to have to deal with. Where? Hey, hey, we're we're already staring into the gaping maw of the apocalypse. Just throw, just throw another, just throw another subject in there that needs to get political for some and, strange reason. And you know what pissed me off? And I'm gonna only go into the technical end because this is a sports story. But Kyrie Irving, Kyrie Irving, the bonehead that Kyrie Irving is, and I'm not going into the sports. Forget the sports. That'll come up on Saturday on episode 117 of Empty the Bench. But 118, 18, oi. Wow, I, I I'm having COVID confusion. And I don't even have COVID, but anyway, um, he another public figure. These public figures who are basically saying to the world, "F you, I don't care. Don't get the vaccine. Don't get healthy. Keep spreading the virus." What do you do? I mean, I still have sympathy. So, but I I, I just. I just shake my head because I don't want them to die, but you know what? What? What can I do here? And the other thing that's not helping with that story in particular, the Brooklyn Nets want to pay the fine, and that could be a business. Talk about it again, Desperado. <laughs> well, yes, but but I'm saying is replace it with an entertainment business, and say someone needs to go do a show, <clears throat> a comedian. Fact, I can give you a good example. 
What? Uh, I can give you a good example of uh, <clears throat> uh, they were filming the Black Panther sequel uh, yes. in, in Atlanta, and, and Letitia Wright supposedly had a back injury, but she refused. Ver- you know, very insistently refused that she was not going to get the vaccine. She was posting all kinds of anti-vax nonsense. Did they, wait a minute? Did they cancel her off social media? She left social media, but they apparently Disney paid her, and she got the vaccine. So money talks, and bullshit rides a bus. You know what? We need to stop giving incentives to people. Pull their money away. Pull their acting away. Pull. The, don't let them compete in in the games. Which I'm pretty sure Disney made it made it abundantly clear what the consequences were of not getting a vaccine. Yeah, but but here's the other problem. What are these athletes and these celebrities doing if they're being told that they can't do what they want if they're not vaccinated? What are they doing? They're suing. Yeah, yeah but, or, or they'll throw a temper tantrum. No, forget the temper tantrum. I could care less. We hear a million temper tantrums every day in this world. And there are a lot pe- there are a lot of people who have way worse situations than these athletes. Yeah. And so I'm sorry. Anything, it makes them look selfish. Right. And if you're suing because you're not willing to do something for the better health the of this world. For the greater good. Greater good, excuse me, of, of the world. Not just our country, the world. Public health. Emphasis on the public then you're probably the dumbest people I've ever met if you're willing to sue because you won't get a vaccine. Which, you know, it's times like these that make me wonder how we ever eradicated polio. And the other we thing is... I never think, got rid of polio and smallpox. You want to put an end to this? If you're, not, if, you, if you're on TV or you're an athlete and you get COVID and you're not vaccinated, then you don't get paid until you're better. Which, again, you're talking about someone very in, in you're talking about Aaron Rodgers in particular, but that's not going to be. But uh, again, the, no, the, because no, because the NFL doesn't want to upset the apple cart. Yes, they yes they don't yes they don't want to have Aaron Rodgers poop his britches, which is the nicest way I can say that. Just say it. You say whatever you want here. They don't want him to shit his pants in fury. <laughs> that's so true, but. Like I said, guys like Aaron Rodgers, Kyrie Irving, Ice Cube. Remember we talked about that? Oh, he won't get vaccinated either? We talked about that. You and I, I think, like, on, on an off conversation, I thought we talked about that because he was shooting a movie oh, or something. Yeah, right? you're right. You're right. You're right. And he turned down, what, like $9 million or something for a yeah, part? For some for some movie he was going to do. All because he won't get a vaccine? That's $9 million down the drain. Which, okay, I guess he... It's not like he needs the money, but still, you're going to throw away an easy payday like that? Give me his job. That's the thing. Like, we're hardworking podcasters trying to build a podcast network, doing content every day, building our shows, the, the many shows, the news shows. Where's our $9 million? I'm not complaining because we're working as hard as we can to get where we need to get. But- no, I'm complaining. <laughs> you're not complaining, but I'm complaining. Well, Sounds like I'm on a soapbox right now on a diatribe, but yeah, ye, hear ye. I miss that. His we gotta bring Royal that back. Is complaining about his chair of gold. I miss that. You gotta bring that back. Well, what is the point of all the plunder and the rape and the pillage? Why? <laughs> and you know what? We have the unfortunate situation where we just lost one of the funniest comedians of all time as well during a COVID pandemic in Bob Saget. Now we don't know. He had COVID. He had COVID. Now I don't think that's the reason, but when you see all these people dying and I guarantee you at one point, we're going to reach a million deaths. If we haven't already. I mean, come on. Cause I guarantee you that figure is an undercount. Probably. And I can't wait for social media. I can't wait for Facebook when they see this go up and they say, naughty, naughty, bad, bad. Don't talk about COVID. What else are we supposed to talk about? It's news. Just to wrap this up, all I can say is please take the proper precautions. No shit. We're talking about public health, like you keep saying. I can't take it anymore. 
It's it, it, it's like a blizzard. Oh, what a segue. Yeah, really. Go ahead. So, um, for those of you who don't know, he's not as uh, my co-host is not as as well versed in the video game industry as I. Am. I love video games, though. Let, let's make that clear. Yes, but, but you're not you're you're not really an active gamer anymore. I was more when I was a kid. I mean, I'm 28. Not like I'm. Not like I'm it's not like I'm gate. I'm not gate gatekeeping you though, but still. So for those of you who don't know, Microsoft has acquired or they are set to acquire the gaming uh, the gaming publisher Activision Blizzard for 68.7 billion which is a record it's the biggest amount they've ever paid to acquire any any studio which means in layman's terms that Microsoft will be acquiring the rights to Call of Duty to World of Warcraft to um Diablo to Diablo and to and the Candy Crush and the Candy Crush and Call of Duty is in itself a multi-billion-dollar industry, so this is pretty big. So taking putting aside the person uh, the 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 controversies that Activision that Activision has inflicted upon themselves in the past couple of months, putting that aside for a second. And talking about what this means for Microsoft, this is, it really seems to me like it's exclusives or die. Because Sony, I look at their competitors. You look at Sony, you look at Nintendo, and you see that Sony has had a lot more exclusives over the past couple of console, console generations. You've had things like Infamous, which sold a lot. You have the Ghost of Tsushima. You, you you got the uh, exclusive rights to work with the Marvel license because you've got Insomniac, and you've got Sucker Punch, and uh, I'm talking about development studios, and you've got Guerrilla Games exclusively working for you and Naughty Dog. So Microsoft, instead of cre instead of you know either starting these studios, they just said, you know what, we'll buy them. Well, that's that's the thing. And they, so they I, bought they bought they bought Bethesda, which came with their software and Zenimax, and which means that they have the rights to Doom now and uh, yeah, but Fallout and to and to Starfield, which is coming out in uh, November. But why 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 spend all the money and do it yourself when you could just purchase a a production company that does it for you? Yeah, and they the fact that they, that this is going to be a huge boost to their. Uh, Xbox Game Pass um, software, which they're which uh, they're really betting on, and the the their generation of hardware is it's really a boom because you need to be able. Look, streaming is the name of the game now. They are betting on you getting an Xbox specifically to use it for Xbox Game Pass, and what it does it it opens up. <coughs> It opens up a, a, a infinite amount of possibilities about what they can do with this license. But the, the thing is, you have to understand what a fall from grace from active uh, this is for Activision. Well, because yeah. Activision is in of is in and of itself a multi billion dollar company. No, no, they shit. were the ones that used to buy other developers. Well, another so being bought themselves, and you can't tell me. The the personal issues I was referring to are the sexual assault allegations. Gee, CEO Bobby Kotick. Wait a minute. So I've, why do I feel like when you throw a dart lately that you're going to hit a sexual harassment situation? This now? is different though because this is Bobby. Co if you know anything about the gaming industry, Bobby Kotick was always one of the untouchable executives. I mean, he, his reputation was pretty much shit among the video game public, but. He was one of the movers and shakers of the industry. If there was something that he committed to, chances are everybody else was going. Everybody else was going to follow. So he was an influencer. If he did something, but, everybody else did yeah, it. But he turned out to be a a verbal and a verbally and sexually abusive asshole. Really, you he know read, why? Uh, he because he's been accused of fostering a culture of, or Activision is accused of. Fostering a culture that's really akin to a frat house, and uh, again, sexual uh, sexual assault allegations from multiple employees, and we know that Kodak was aware of all this stuff and did nothing. 
what's interesting here is that one of the people who went hardest after him and Activision by, uh, by, you know, by, by proxy was Phil Spencer, who is the president of Microsoft Games now. So I guess Microsoft felt like, you know what, in order to fix this problem, we'll buy him. Well, you need to remember one thing here with companies like Microsoft, companies like Google, companies like Amazon, $68.7 billion to Microsoft is FU money, um, believe it or not. It, it It is, but I mean, it's, I would and, say. Now, true, let, so. now, now, let me clear up one thing. I'm not talking about that they paid off just to get rid of those situations. They can afford oh, no, that. No, no, no. Wait no, a minute. No, no. They can afford that money and 10 times more if they really wanted to. Yes, but the issue that I have here is that Kodak, you know, gets to stay in his CEO role. Oh, I didn't until, hear that. I didn't until, hear it. But until the sale goes through at the end of next year, and then he leaves. Apparently, that's contingent upon you, the deal. You know why? Uh, because yesterday, I think I think Jason Schreier and um, well, uh, I can tell you why companies do that. Bloomberg, I'm breaking. I'm blanking on her name. No, but you want to know why companies do that? Companies do that because they don't want to upset the apple cart before a deal. So they keep the current management in place until they the deal is secured and it goes through. So Kodak is out, but he should have been out ages ago. He should have been out ages ago, and he's due to make a significant amount a, a significant amount as a gold parachute. So the rich are getting richer, and the scumbag is getting is getting a big payday. He's Nick. not actually getting what he deserves, which is Nick. criminal prosecution. Nick, unfortunately, you're talking about a situation that's not only in the gaming <laughs> community, you're talking about CEOs of major companies that have major secrets that they live behind. And when they get, and when they finally get investigated and they're told, uh, their stories are told in truth, what do, the companies have to get rid of them, and the only way they can get rid of them is by giving them gold parachute, so that they could start fresh with someone else in charge. And that in, is entirely my point: the fact that they can fess up to fess up to, or essentially fess up to what they did, and still escape without facing any kind of punitive measures is, is just horrible. By the it's way, fucking bullshit is what it is. By the way, it says that according to the California Department of Fair Employment and Housing, uh, that sued Activision Blizzard for, like you said, promoting a culture of constant sexual harassment, and quote, and more employees have come forward with more allegations of sexual misconduct ever since, and the company reached an $18 million settlement with the U.S. Equal Opportunity, uh, Opportunity Commission in September. Which, if the state of California is on your ass because of the... Because of, of what happened here, that means you know you screwed up. And I wouldn't say California is exactly the best run state by any means, but yes, but to, but in order to but in order to get any sort of governmental body involved in an investigation to what you did, I mean, it doesn't look good. And also, look at the facts. At the also, very least, it doesn't look good. Wait a minute. It says that first of all, <laughs> I, it says that the settlement is being appealed. And reports indicate that nearly 40 Activision Blizzard employees have reportedly exited the company since last July. Oh, yeah. You, you've seen you've seen uh, a whole bunch of Activision Blizzard employees walk off the job. Um, it's strike because really they wanted Kodak gone. And um, you've seen you've seen a bunch of them resign. too. Well, a lot of the people that were responsible for propagating that kind of abuse or looking the other way were the ones who resigned, so I can't really shed any more... I can't really shed any tears for them. Nick. Money. Yes, yes, I understand. I, and I'm not I'm not agreeing with it in any way, shape, or form. It's but like what you took the whole really, meeting. Like, it's emblematic of the problems that... Uh, it's emblematic of several problems in the gaming industry. The it's fact, not just the gaming I, industry, though, Nick. That My I'm point just, is... Putting aside the personal issues, just for a second. Right. The fact that Microsoft can just buy everybody and not leave no one. competition, that's antitrust lawsuits. Wait a minute. That's wait. Antitrust. wait it a minute. It should be a violation of antitrust laws, but it's not. For what? Buying up a company that has sexual harassment yes, claims? Buying up buying up several buying up several major several major publishers and developers. Well, buying up developers and publishers is the name of the game. I understand what you're saying about the sexual yes, harassment claim. But it should not be the name of the game. 
You can Nick. say the same thing about the, it's monopolizing. All right, but unfortunately, and this is just my my prediction gut going 10, 15 years from now, maybe, or sooner, I think you're going to see away with the Monopoly rule at some point. And, I, and the reason I... Board game, folks. Uh, right. I'm talking about, like, in my business, because I, I can give you an example. In the radio business, in every market in the country, you can technically own up to eight radio stations under a conglomerate. So the problem that you're having, though, is that because companies and radio stations are going out of business, the bigger conglomerates are buying them up. So how do you stop a monopoly? You can't. It's, it's like a Russian nesting doll of, of you know, corporate conglomerates. And when you look at... And and, well, the, the way you stop that is stronger federal law, federal antitrust laws. Well, you know that people are paying off the government. Come on now. like, but And I'm not well, saying again, that... I'm not naive. I'm just saying, in general, that's what it would take. And good, because Facebook will come after me and say, you can't say that people are paying off the government. Well, am I lying? Am I lying here? You've not given me any evidence to the contrary, so therefore I'm, yeah. So, and I think you started to say this, but let's just make it clear that uh, Kodak is going to be reporting to Spencer. But... Yeah, yeah, and and uh, Phil Spencer got a promotion to to the uh, CEO of, of Microsoft Games. Yeah, Microsoft Games. So let's just make it clear. Yeah, it encompasses all their Xbox and PC and the um and uh, their cloud gaming division. But let's make it clear. So he's now responsible for everything that Kodak does. Yeah. So therefore, you give him the heave ho, and you not get and the the right thing to do would be giving him the heave ho and not giving him a goddamn dime. Now. Well, that's not going to happen because he'll sue through the Stone Age. Again, that's not going to happen. But still, we're to, I'm working within the field of wishful thinking here. Right. And by the way, the Golden Parachute, which I think is the dumbest thing in all of business, by the way, is you should we should refer to the Golden Parachute clause as basically the escape clause, because a lot of times yeah. the Golden Parachute is not used for positive. It's used for negative to escape. It's the asshole's choice ejector seat. Right, so it is. Or, it's the ejector seat for assholes. It was originally, I think, the golden parachute was originally created so that someone could walk away if they wanted to do something else or they wanted to retire and they can't move up anymore. That was the original reason for the golden parachute, wasn't it? But yeah, that was the original reason for it. But again, it was used a lot with Goldman Sachs and Lehman Brothers financial before. companies. Yes, yeah. financial institutions that were. Basically, you know, they they screwed everybody over, and then they got to and then they got to retire with a multi million dollar payout. Well, who was the former uh, CEO of uh, Viacom, uh, CBS? That was uh, what's his name? That's he didn't he end up with a golden yes, parachute he because yeah, he was an idiot? Quite, quite substantial, if I'm not because he was an idiot. He did stupid things. Which, That's what I'm talking about here. The Golden Parachute originally was created so that someone could walk away and be happy with what they did. Now it's it's the idiot ejector seat. Yeah, like I said, it's the ass. It, like I, no, I said the asshole ejector seat. I'm trying to be nice, the but you're right. For assholes. Right. So, the and they're saying now that this uh, this deal is supposedly going to close in the fiscal year 2023. Now, the reason it's going to take up to 18 months. The uh, SEC is going to have a field day going through this whole deal. Oh yeah, and I and I would hope they go through this with a fine tooth comb because you have agreements, you have affiliations, you have big name CEOs and companies transferring power. That's why it's going to take eighteen months. And I understand. I understand because. You're gonna you're gonna have gamers coming after me going, well, Bo well, Bobby Bobby uh, Kotick was a, was a terrible CEO. Yes, he was. I'm putting that aside. The the, the fact that the fact that the games that that came out under his tenure were by and large crap, and, and uh, he, the the fact that the fact that the EA ended up um when he was at EA he ended up canceling more Star Wars games than he actually made, and and. The, the fact that they're coming out with 15 Call of Duties in 15 years. Putting that aside, the main reason he's a dickhead is because of the sexual harassment thing. But, 
<coughs> excuse me. Activision is an <coughs> Activision is an incredible company in a lot of ways. Because to go back to my childhood for a second, the Tony Hawk Pro Skater games. They go back even further than that. No, no, but that, yeah. right? But that's what I grew up on, like the Pro Skater game. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of things. But the Neversoft Spider-Man games. Right. And don't they have the eyeball? Isn't that like their signature yeah. thing for the never? Yeah, they, yeah, before Activision shut them down too. But it'll be interesting to see, because like you said, is this a monopoly? I don't know. But you still have Nintendo. You still have Nintendo. You still have Sony. And Nintendo's going to do what they do and make still make money hand over fist and people don't care. The so. sick part is, and I'm going to throw out a very ridiculous theory here. I usually do this in sports theories, but I'm going to throw this out here. Could I could see maybe in a decade, maybe I could see Sony and Microsoft come together for a super company down down. Oh, Microsoft already tried to buy Nintendo. You know that? No, no, I'm talking about Sony and Microsoft. Oh, the, the, no, they see each other as direct competitors, though. No, I'm saying if one got bigger than the other. If one got bigger than the other, maybe. I st Actually, believe it or not, I think this might make Microsoft bigger than Sony at this point. It may just because they, uh, they I think, encompass a larger amount of things that they do. Because it's not just it's not just gaming anymore. It's it's the uh, it's so it's software and it's hardware. I mean, we're talking we're we're forgetting one competition for gaming streaming. Twitch. Twitch is not real. They don't they don't create their own. They're they're a platform. They, they no don't. no. But can you imagine? Because Amazon made a killing going yeah. after Twitch. Yeah, <laughs> and look at them now. Somehow that that means they the somehow they mean. That means that they think that they can make can make games, which is not, which I don't know where the hell they got that, which, uh, how the hell they got that idea. I wonder if Amazon was in the competition for Activision. I'm curious. I don't know. I think I heard that rumor. It's been it's been kicked around uh, for a while that that Activision was going was going to be sold, even though Bobby Kotick apparently didn't uh, apparently didn't want it. But you know what's incredible, and I know you keep telling me the one game I look at is the one I annoyingly play on my phone every day, uh, Candy, Crush. Candy Crush. Well, Activision obviously is the king of addicting games and figuring out what people like. Because you can't go out, well, when you can go out, when you're not dealing with COVID, and you see people on their phone playing a colorful game of Candy Crush on their phone constantly. It's so obviously, penetration is what it is. But I'm saying they know what they're doing. They know their shit. I know. I just so like, yeah, but the, the, these are the things. That, these the, these are the things that I'm that I have I have problems with. But again, your mileage may vary. And I yeah, I was going to mention this earlier about CEOs. CEOs, even though they might be the smartest people in the room. And they know how to run a company because that's their job, chief executive officer. And but there are times when CEOs abuse their power, abuse it. Oh, I know that. Yeah. And just uh, put Bobby Kotick on the list of millions of CEOs where they say, my shit don't stink. I can do what I want and no one's going to tell me what to do. And hopefully I can hide it for long enough that I made my money and then I disappear forever. Right? Yep. It's just a weird thing. It's it's a lot of money. We're talking about billions. Oh, uh, boy. We're, we're talking about $70 billion here. It's, I know. It's one of the largest deals in history. I know. Now... Obviously, like you said, and I've said this to people, I've had conversations with people about it. Gaming is up there with gambling. They're the top two things right now. Well, yeah. And I'm I'm not talking about sports gaming. I'm talking about gaming, video gaming. Yeah. We're, we're talking about team tournaments. <laughs> Excuse me. In video games where teams are winning hundreds of thousands of dollars. And esports. I mean... You could go out there and own an, uh, and own a percentage of an esports team if you wanted to. Now, why do you, why do you think esports people make so much money playing video games? It wouldn't be there if there wasn't a market. What I'm saying is, you and I could go out on the open market if we wanted to, 
purchase a percentage of an esports team and just have money come in if we wanted to. We're in the wrong racket, man. All I'm just telling you. Business, we're in the wrong racket. No, I mean, podcasting is a growing business too. But if you and I said tomorrow, <laughs> excuse me, that we were going to spend a couple thousand dollars even, I know that's nothing, but, and we wanted to go purchase a percentage of a beginning esports team, I guarantee you that couple thousand dollars will turn into millions if we held on to it long enough. Yeah. But, all right. Here we are. So Moving on. All right. Joining us after we're done with this conversation, if I can actually speak words, is comedian Maria Dakotas. Now, Nick, I want to just tell you about who she is. <laughs> Excuse me, because I think I started to tell you, you looked at me funny at first. And then when I said, oh, she was the uh, governor and former governor, Andrew Cuomo impersonator. You're like, ah, because uh, it's a rich, it's a rich vein of comedy. I mean, it's she's, a, it's a it's a cottage industry at this point, right? And she is funny. She's hilarious, <laughs> and she actually just did. Uh, I think uh, either a couple days ago, or she did a um, impression of Kathy Hochul, the current governor. Yeah, yeah, I saw that entering the governor's mansion. So let's see. So let's see what you did. She was nice enough to. Uh, she was nice enough to sit down with you. So let's throw. Let's throw it to future you. Just be warned. Yeah, past you, I should say. Just be warned. If you go on social media, you'll see some very funny videos because she does some every day. So, just be warned. All right, to the interview. Joining me on Beyond the Bench. This is a very funny comedian who I really enjoy. That enjoy a lot. Uh, based in a lot of. Uh, different mediums, Rolling Stone, New York Times, Wall Street Journal. I could go down a whole list. She has a lot of credits. And uh, I found, I discovered her doing a very funny impression during the pandemic at the beginning. And she's known for a lot more. We'll get into that through this whole interview. And uh, Maria Dakotas joins me right now. Hi, Maria. Hi, Nick. Thank you for having me. So like I've been asking everybody so far, how have you been during the pandemic to the beginning? Um... You know, it's been hard. It's been, um, you know, I'm sure it's been very hard for everyone. I think I've just been trying to stay creative and do things that make me happy to try to get through it since it seems like there's no end in sight right now. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to be, I don't want to be too um, gloomy, but you know, I don't know. It's, it's tough. Yeah, it's very tough. And what made me laugh, and a lot of people laugh at the beginning of the pandemic, is you really came out and did an amazing impression of somebody. We'll get into former Governor Cuomo. And uh, what made you do this? Did you wake up one day and say, I was looking for something to make me laugh? Was there another motivation? What made you do that? Good question. Like what make what possesses someone to do something like that? Um, yeah, I so, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, I didn't know I, I didn't have a TV. So I, I didn't I couldn't I wasn't really watching the news. I didn't really know much of what was going on. I was getting most of my news from like Twitter. And then my roommate had a TV in her room, though, and she was watching the governor's briefings every day. And one day she was just like, hey, Maria, you have to come in here and like see the governor's briefings. And I was like, oh, I didn't even know this was this was happening. And um, I was just watching him. And uh, then he started to like go on this tangent about all his personal life and his issues with his family. And I was uh, captivated, honestly, because I was like, what's happening? Is the press reacting to this what what is their reaction what, what's going on i just wanted to know what people thought about what they were seeing because it was unusual to me and um i thought it was really funny so then i decided you know and i i had been making videos before that but i was mostly performing live you know stand-up comedy and since we couldn't perform live anymore i kind of didn't really have anything else to do so i figured i would put all of my energy into making um online content and i was inspired inspiration struck and then i just i just went from there and i saw that this is something he did regularly it was talk about his personal life so there was kind of a uh just a well of material 
did you think daily briefing the boyfriend and meatballs would take a whole new meaning before doing the whole uh governor cuomo situation or did you just say hmm <laughs> yeah, yeah i guess i just um i saw what that he was talking about these things i thought it was funny i thought it was interesting so i just decided to do something about it and then people liked it i guess <laughs> No, no, it was definitely funny, and definitely it changed a lot of our moods, including myself, who was very uh, depressed about COVID, and it definitely brought my mood up for sure. Um, Glad for that. But then I saw the Kathy Hochul video, the recent video, and I mm -hmm. said, definitely she struck gold twice. Now, <laughs> you really, uh, you know how to make these videos. Now, tell me what the, was that the same thing? Was that a different motive? Was that, or what about that video? Yeah, well, I, um, well, you know, all that stuff went down with Cuomo and, um, it was pretty disappointing and sad. And then we had the first female governor of New York, which is pretty exciting. She, you know, she's making history and I was like, well, why not just like, you know, I don't know, do something with her because she's here. She's in charge now. Let's see what she's up to. And I thought it would be kind of funny you know, seeing her like move into the governor's mansion and see what kind of like what Cuomo left for her to. <laughs> so I, um, yeah, that was like the idea that I had there. Just thought it was interesting. Now talking about the effort, is it a lot of effort to like do the dress up part or is that something you like to do? Do you, is it the impression? Like how is, how much effort does the overall timing take to do these videos? Cause that seems like a lot of effort on your part. Yes, it is a lot of energy and time and effort and, and research, really. I mean, when I was doing the Cuomo videos, you know, I was watching all of his briefings and I was taking material out of each briefing and making notes of, OK, on this day, at this um, time of his briefing, he talked about his family and I would write that down and I would kind of make notes about whenever he would talk about his family and then I would go back, extract the audio. Then I would listen to the audio over and over again, come up with a concept in my mind of like what I wanted to see visually with this audio, what he was doing while the audio is playing, come up with a video concept, then like memorize the audio because I was lip syncing it. So memorize the audio um, kind of you know, make a shot list basically of what I, what we're going to see, then perform it and do take after take after take of me messing up the lip sync and me like looking in the camera and being like, God damn it. And, uh, and then of course, getting to the final editing process and editing the video together. And you have all this, you have all these like takes that you have to edit together. So that was definitely like a very big operation to do those ones. The Kathy Hochul videos, I was like, well, I'm not going to lip sync her. She's she's a different character than Cuomo. You know, she doesn't she doesn't go on these like crazy weird tangents about her family. She's a little more grounded. Uh, so I figured, well, why don't I just try to learn an impression with my voice, you know, try to do an impression of her and put her in like imaginary scenarios in my head of like, OK, what's what's it going to look like of her moving into the governor's mansion? What's it going to look like when she has to teach her staff about sexual harassment training? You know, and so those were kind of like those were a little less time consuming. I mean, but still learning the impression was a lot, but it's just a different, a different kind of effort. Now I can't remember. Did Cuomo call out the, not call out, but did he recognize the impression or did you get to see him at all when it happened or? He did. I mean, he called me on the phone. Um, I think in like May, pretty, pretty early on when all of it was happening. And it was, it was, nice i mean i had it was a nice phone call he was very nice to me and um said that his daughters loved my video uh which was nice uh but yeah i don't think he ever publicly said anything about it like on social media or anything but um yeah he did call me okay and those videos are great there's a lot of other things to talk about and Mm -hmm. I see your credits. They're very impressive. I was looking around and you've done singing, dancing. There's a lot of things we're going to talk about. I'll get back to the credits in a second. But can you talk about how you got into being a comedian and a writer? What was it at a young age? Like, when did you start 
getting into this stuff? Um, yeah, so I kind of knew that I wanted to be a performer since I was a kid. It was just kind of something that just felt natural to me. Like I eat, I sleep and I make people laugh. <laughs> like I would make, I would use my parents' video camera and make like videos as a kid. And I have so many videos of me when I was like nine years old, dressing up in different characters and putting on plays and I, I used to do like a fake newscast and I would like play all the different newscasters and uh and then I wanted to do theater and so I asked my mom if I could do like community theater and then she drove me around to do community theater and all the rehearsals and the performances and then when I was in high school then I started doing you know theater at my high school of course and then I went to school for acting. So it's just always, I just always knew it was what I wanted to do just since I was a kid. And then one of the videos I really discovered was uh, the Mike Birbiglia understudy video, which <laughs> I laughed at a ton. And that's what I, I like about your performance is that you can keep me consistently laughing. A lot of people consistently laughing. Um, Thank you. Can, you. can you take me back to that experience of that day uh, of doing the scrambler uh, bit or or performance, I should say, not bit performance. Yeah, no, it was um, it was amazing. I mean, it was so much fun. I remember because Mike, you know, did this sort of like understudy contest thing where he had people send in videos, and uh, I just thought it would be a fun idea to translate it into Italian since he has a very obviously Italian last name. Even though he talks about that he's like a very American Italian, I just thought it would be fun. So then when you know i was one of the winners of the competition i went into the theater you know that night and ira glass was there i did i didn't know he was going to be there and he saw me and he's sort of like looking at me like who is this person because he didn't recognize me because in my video i have like a mess mustache painted on <laughs> and he was like who is this and then he was like oh it's you you're the one with the mustache and i was like yeah i know i look cuter with the mustache uh but then yeah, then it, it was so cool because I didn't know Ira was even going to be a part of my performance. And then he was my my like translator on stage live. And that was like so exciting. So we did like some rehearsals beforehand. I mean, we only really rehearsed a few times, me and Ira together. And then and then it was like showtime. And then we and then we did it. And I just I remember being backstage and like hearing like a thousand people in the crowd and just be like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I'm about to go out there. But when I went out, when I went out there, I just you know, all my nerves went away and I was just, I was like really excited to be there. It was so fun. Now getting to do performances like Comedy Central, HBO, different comedy festivals and doing that performance. Do you like feeding off crowds? Do you like moving around on the stage? Like what, what's your ideas of when you're out on stage in that regard? Yeah. I mean, I think definitely a, a big part of being a comic is is feeding off the crowd and like, you know, feeling the energy in the room because you're all in there together having this experience together. And as much as it's like kind of a monologue as a stand up, it's a dialogue, too, because you, you have to be listening to what's going on. And um, yeah, what's fun about like that theater performance with Mike Birbiglia was that I was doing something very like dramatic and absurd and just kind of like flowing with the energy of the room and throwing my body around and doing weird stuff and and making weird, weird dramatic gestures was was very fun and the crowd added so much to that because they kind of tell you what they want to see next and how how long they want you to linger in a moment you know you can feel it and with stand up um you know i'm a, i'm a little i feel like I, i'll like go into characters in stand up but I'm a little more tame than that than that specific Birbiglia performance because I'm more, you know, standing there talking into a mic, talking about myself and my experience. Uh, but I can get I can get a, a, a little crazy with the characters and stuff. And then of course I'll do some crowd work, but I try not I, I'm not I'm not like a mean comedian. I know some comedians can be kind of mean to the audience, which is fair in its own right. Like if that's what you feel. You need to give the world right now by all means but yeah if i'm gonna feed off the audience i'm usually not mean i try to invite them into you know into something that i'm talking about that we can relate on i guess another 
thing to relate to that, and I asked this to a few comedians I've had on this show, is cancel culture. Now, I know a lot of people don't like that phrase. I don't like that phrase. I think it's BS, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. um, what's your take on cancel culture? And are you worried that if you say one thing that everything could go up in smoke, so to speak? Um, I think that cancel culture, I think that many people who we perceive to be canceled really aren't canceled. You know, like I think people are like, oh, we canceled Louis C.K. or we canceled Aziz Ansari or whatever, but we really didn't. I mean, Louis C.K. is still working all the time. He still is like doing sets at the Comedy Cellar and stuff. And I, the thing, kind of my take on cancel culture is like, I, I agree with Jamila Jamil, who talks about this a lot, where she says that she had to do a lot of learning and she didn't really used to identify as a feminist. And now she does. And she had to do a lot of learning to get there. And if she had been like canceled for some of the things that she said or believed and wasn't given the opportunity to grow and change, then she wouldn't be in the place she is now to make the world a better place from, from, you know, the high position that she holds where she has a lot of following and she has a lot of influence. And if she were just discredited and not given the chance to grow, like she wouldn't be where she is now, like helping other people see things differently. Uh, I think that as long as people, if people do something wrong, you just have to have accountability for it. And I think that a lot of people don't take accountability and then they're presumed to be canceled, but they really aren't like they're still working and they're still like, I can't even really think of someone who's truly, truly canceled, canceled because they always find a way to come back, even if they don't take accountability. But I think what everyone wants to see is just accountability. And I, and I don't think that, I think we just want to see retribution for the pain that you caused people. Um, so I think if, you know, if I say something wrong or if I do something that causes pain, I always try to listen if someone says that I'm, that I'm, if I'm doing something that's hurting people, that's a, that's a gift for someone that they gave you that was probably really scary and hard for them to speak up. And so I think that every person, no matter what your job is, that if someone says that to you, you need to take it as an opportunity to look inward, understand why you did that, why you said that, why you believe that, and try to work on yourself to be better, take accountability for what happened, and be able to move forward um, without you know, without trying to ask too much of the people that you caused pain, you know, like it's not their job to make everything better. It's your job to, to look inward and, and do better. But a lot of people don't do that. And I think that's the problem. Um, I don't know if I gave you, it's a complicated answer. <laughs> no, no, that, that, that was perfect. That was exactly, <laughs> that was a really good answer. And I'll follow up with, is there anything off limits to you on the stage or are you just willing to go wherever your creativity goes like on the stage? To me, it's not so much there's topics that are off limits. It's the way that you talk about them and it's the way that you frame them. And I think as long as you're not punching down on like an oppressed community, as long as you're always punching up at, like you, you have to be making fun of the institution or the power structure or the oppressor. And as long as you're doing that, it's going to be funnier, first of all, because punching down just isn't funny. And as long as you're doing that, I don't think any topic is off limits because it's not really about the topic. It's about how you're framing it and who you're making fun of. No, that makes sense. And I, I agree with everything you said so far. Um, I want to move to versatility, like I said earlier, where your impressions are a 10, uh, a million, in oh, my thank opinion. Thank you. <laughs> and like some of the ones that I listed, like the Ariana Grande one is off the charts, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, the Nikki Glaser, Nancy Pelosi, Elizabeth Warren, all the different ones that you've done. Is there any impression that you haven't tried that you really want to attempt? Yeah, you know, I've been trying to work on some and impressions for me take a long time and a long, it's a long, long game of 
like practicing every day for short periods of time so that I don't go out of my mind. I know some people might be able to learn them really fast, but I'm I'm just not like that. Um, but right now I'm like trying to learn a Joe Pesci impression. <laughs> it's not good. Like I'm not going to do it for you. But I, yeah, I really want to like widen my, my like arsenal of impressions and I want to do some men and see if I can really stretch myself and stretch my voice to go there because I think that I think I can find it. It's just um, it's just you learn so much about like your voice and, and your limits and how far you can take things. And, and you can even really like stretch your voice to go deeper than you thought it could or go higher than you thought it could. And there's so many qualities of of your voice that come out that can surprise you. And that's what's really exciting about learning impressions. But right now I am trying to learn a, a Joe, Joe Pesci, but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> I mean, even the accents, like you nail the accents to a T, like the laugh with Ariana Grande, like you nailed that. Like, <laughs> how long do you spend on impressions? Is it weeks? Is it months? Is it what? what is the process when you say, OK, I'm going to do somebody to when you say, OK, I'm going to do it publicly once I figure it out? Yeah, that's a good question. I actually most of the impressions that I learned were for an audition because I was sending in an audition tape for SNL. And I knew that I needed to know some impressions. And I was like, okay, well, I don't really do impressions, but you know, why don't I try? So, <laughs> so I, I tried to learn some and that those kind of, I learned over a few months before I turned in like my videotape. And then since then just been trying to strengthen them. And, um, you know, the more that you listen and watch the performers, the more it just kind of like absorbs into you. Um, but yeah, I would say like a few months, even just to get like, okay, this is acceptable. But to be really, really strong, I would say like six or more months, I think. So moving from that to something I found really cool was your dancing. I saw the videos and Thanks. and I can you talk about uh, being a Lindy Hopper? Because I found that very interesting in watching the dances. It's so random, right? I, um, yeah, when I was, so actually, when I graduated high school, I went to Georgia Tech for a year, and I studied mechanical engineering, because I was like, oh, well, you know, I don't know if I should be an actor for my life. Like, you know, people always say it's too competitive, and and I wasn't sure it's what I wanted to do. But then I realized that it was what I wanted to do. So then I went to, I transferred to study acting. But my first year at Georgia Tech, I was a part of like this theater club and the film club. Um, and one of my friends who was in the theater club with me was like, hey, Marie, I'm going to this dance. It's a free dance like on campus. Do you want to come? And I was like, okay. And then they were doing swing dancing. And I was like, oh, this is fun. And, and then I just fell in love with it. Like I went that one night and I, I had such a great time. And then I saw that it's something they do regularly and they have classes and, and then I just got really into it. And it was really fun because like, I'm a nerd and, <laughs> and I wasn't like, I wasn't going to normal like college parties, like drinking and like playing beer pong. Like I just wasn't cool. So I think that's kind of where that came from, where I was like, I'm going to go Lindy Hop on a Friday night. And um, yeah, so then I started doing that and I and I loved it because it was just so much fun and you're like moving your body and it's collaborative and it's, you know, partner dancing. So you're meeting other nerds, like how fun. And then uh, and then when I went to school in Boston, I continued to do that like in my free time. And I remember all my roommates like going to frat parties at Harvard and I was like, I'm going to go to a swing dance. And that was kind of my life. <laughs> that was kind of my social situation. Uh, yeah. No, oh, that's great. And then the music, which I discovered as well. So you play ukulele, right? Yes. Yeah. So how did you get into playing uh, ukulele and uh, uh, writing music? I can't remember where I like saw the ukulele or why I wanted to play it. But when I was a kid, I played the clarinet. And so, you know, at school, I played the clarinet. So I like knew how to read music and music was always a part of my life. And I also like, you know, sang when I did community theater and stuff. And I don't know why I started writing songs, but I saw the ukulele somewhere and I, and I really 
thought it was like a beautiful instrument and the sound is very beautiful. And so my mom got me a ukulele for a Christmas present one year. And then I just started learning songs on it. And then I just started writing my own songs. And uh, that was just kind of something that I did for fun on the side. And whenever I would be inspired to write or sing, singing just is very like therapeutic for me. And so I, I it was just like a way to, to um, just to like feel good. And yeah. And then when I got to the city, I s- kind of um, got hooked up with this organization who records music for artists uh, for much cheaper than it would normally be if you like rent a studio and do all that. And the guy who runs it, like, you know, he's like a Juilliard trained musician and he plays all these different instruments. And so he helps you kind of arrange music around the songs that you wrote. Um, so, uh, yeah, so they're called recording artist development if anyone wants to know. And that's where I recorded my music in New York. And then I just sort of, you know, it was a great way to just like put it out there. And I was like, okay, now my music's out there, you know, so people can listen to it if they want to or not, whatever. <laughs> no, that, that's awesome. And, uh, I'll wrap up with this and Maria, I thank you for, uh, the time you gave me, um, looking in a sports point of view, I think of you as a five tool player that does a lot of different things. And by the way, I think it's more than five tools. It seems like a million tools at this point, (laughs) Um, showing the most versatility possible, comedy, acting, singing, dancing. I saw you do commercials. I saw you do short films. You've done a lot. Um, Is there something else that you would like to add to that versatility that you haven't even done yet? Oh, um, you know, I really would love to learn the piano because I used to take lessons when I was a kid and I quit. And I'm really mad at myself for quitting. So I really do think I would love to learn the piano. Yeah. No, that's that's great. And like I said, go check Maria out. And actually, uh, is there where do you want people to check you out so that people can find you? Yeah, um, they can go to my Twitter or my Instagram. It's just at my first and last name. And your videos are great. Like I saw over the past couple, of, I saw you post the video. I think it was yesterday of the one in the bed. I thought that was really fun. So do you just, do you come up with like sometimes social media videos on the spot just where you say, I'm, I'm just, I have inspiration right now and I'm just going to do a video or. I kind of try to like think of like, sometimes I'll just be walking around and I'll have an idea and then I'll write it down. Or sometimes I'll actively be like trying to think of ideas, but usually my best ideas come when I'm not trying to think of ideas. You know what I mean? (laughs) So yeah. Cause if you're thinking too hard, then things don't happen naturally. Yeah, exactly. So, Maria, this was fun. I got to put a name to a face because I watched your videos over the pandemic. And uh, this was a lot of fun. Yes, thank you for having me. All right. Welcome back to episode 14 of Beyond the Bench. Nick Federer, Nick Morgison. <clears throat> that was a great interview with Maria Dakotis. And make sure you go check out her uh, massive impressions, especially, I don't know if the whole governor, former governor, Andrew Cuomo, impersonations are exactly appropriate anymore. <laughs> I mean, if they still get views, I mean, she's a comedian, right? So, yeah. Well, yeah. And, but yeah, big thanks to her. So, the, thank you for, thank you for indulging us. Yes. Uh, comedians seem to like this show for whatever reason. Yeah. I don't know why. I mean, we're not, we're not technically a, a comedy podcast. So, I, I, may, maybe, maybe that's the racket we should be in. First, it was uh, Shuli Igor. We used to be on the Howard Stern show. Now it's Maria Dakotis. And I might have a few more things up my sleeve, which might be that's dangerous when I have things up my sleeve. So but. just make sure. So make sure again. Make sure you like. Make sure you like and subscribe, and make sure you stay tuned because we got a lot of a lot of stuff coming. Follow us on Twitter at Beyond the Bench One. Follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Beyond the Bench One, and make sure you follow uh, the podcast network at ETV Network. All right. So for Nick Ferrara. I'm Nick Morgan. We'll see you next week for episode 15. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. See you back on the bench.